Hello and welcome to Sunday School. We are using the adult Bible studies uh, curriculum from Cooksbury. And we're on the lesson for August 2nd, 2020, Life-Changing Encounter. Our story today comes from the story of Zacchaeus that we see in Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Now, sometimes if you've been following along, you notice that I go with what's in the book, and sometimes I just take the text and run with it. I think what we find in the book this time is pretty good, so I'm okay working with that. You know, you know, I'll add other stuff to it and question some of it, but that's just normal, and that's what you do in any Sunday school class. The, the text today reads like this. He entered Jericho. Now, the he here is Jesus. He entered Jericho and is passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him, because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry, come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, He is gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I'll pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Truly salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. The Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. Well, let's pray as we start off today. Father, we thank you again today for your word. We thank you for the gift of the Gospels, the four collections of stories about Jesus, the four ways of telling his biography, the story of who he is and what he's about. We thank you for this story of Zacchaeus that many people learn as little children about a little song about a wee little man named Zacchaeus who climbs up in a sycamore tree. Help us to learn from this story and to respond to you in faith as we think about it. Amen. The author starts today, this is page 90, talking about a life-changing event he went to. It was held in Dallas, Texas, uh, at a football stadium. There were 40,000 men there, and he had a great experience there. Now, the description he gives of it sounds exactly like a Promise Keepers rally that I went to in Dallas, well, actually in Irving at the old Cowboys Stadium, uh, probably the same one. And it was a good experience. I went there. Uh, I went there with my dad. Uh, this was probably maybe 20 years ago, 18 years ago, something like that. Heard lots of speakers, sang lots of good songs, good fellowship with, with other believers. It was a powerful experience. And I looked for ways to get the men in the church I was pastoring at that time involved. So uh, Promise Keepers is still involved today, still out there in the world. In fact, I've heard that they're having online gatherings coming up uh, just next week or this weekend. Yeah, it's this weekend. So by the time you hear this, it'll probably be too late, but we'll see. There's other ways to connect with them. The author says on the middle of page 91, Zacchaeus also had a life-changing experience. When he met Jesus, he went from a powerful and untrustworthy tax collector to a repentant and neighborly friend to others. What did he see in Jesus? Yeah, we wonder about that. We, we wonder about this guy that had a bad reputation. We're going to see that everybody knew who Zacchaeus was. He was a sinner. He was a bad guy. He was not one of us. Oh, yeah, maybe he's a Jew. Maybe he's a son of Abraham, but... He's not really one of us. He works for the Romans, works for the occupying forces. He's a bad guy. And yet here's this Zacchaeus who sees something in Jesus, something to make him curious about Jesus. And I wonder if he'd had other more distant encounters with Jesus before. I wonder if he'd heard people talking about Jesus I wonder if, if maybe Jesus' followers, his disciples, had already been there in town, and Zacchaeus had gotten to know some of them or, or heard their message or seen what they were doing, and it was through what they were doing 
that Zacchaeus was curious about Jesus. And, and I wonder there about the people in our community, maybe the people in your community, if you're not in my community. What is it that's going on that's making them curious about Jesus? What is it that's making them willing and interested to go seek out Jesus? One of the things I like to do in my community is prayer walking, or sometimes if it's more distantly, prayer driving. Just going out walking, driving around, praying for each house and the family that lives there, praying for the businesses that, that I drive by, the schools that are around in our community, and praying for God to make those people hungry for him. I wonder if maybe the disciples of Jesus were going around Zacchaeus' community, praying, Lord, make these people hungry for you. Give them a hunger for your kingdom, a, a hunger to listen to Jesus and experience the transformation that we've experienced. So I, I wonder about that here. But I also wonder not just what Zacchaeus saw in Jesus, but I wonder what Jesus saw in Zacchaeus. Jesus is going to see him up there in the tree, this little guy up there, and he's going to say, Zacchaeus, he knows his name. Do you notice that? He doesn't say, hey, dude, up in the tree, what's your name? Jesus knows his name is Zacchaeus. And he calls him down and says, I have to go to your house today. We're going to look at that more in just a minute. But what does Jesus see in Zacchaeus? And again, I, I pray for us. I pray for the people in my congregation. I pray for myself. Lord, help me see people the way you do. Help me to see in people, people who look like sinners, people who might look like they're far from you. Help me to see in them what you see in them. Help me to see the promise you see in them. Help me see the capacity and capability you see in them. Help me, like Jesus, to extend grace to them, to extend an invitation that draws them in so that they never look at my life, so they never look at my church and say, oh, those people, they, they'd never accept me. I'm, I'm just not the right kind of person. I'm not good enough. I'm not in the right realm or circles of society. The Lord draw us and connect us with people like Zacchaeus. That's what I pray. Then the next section here, the author starts in bottom of page 91, talks about Zacchaeus's curiosity. He says, Zacchaeus's curiosity got the best of him. He had to see Jesus. It's not like he just goes out and says, oh yeah, it would be really nice if I could see Jesus. And he goes out there and says, eh, all these tall people, they're on the way and I can't see Jesus. So maybe another time. Zacchaeus was convinced he had to see Jesus. And he was willing to do whatever it took to see Jesus. I wonder about you. What are you willing to do to experience Jesus? Are, are you waiting for somebody to come knock on your door? Are you wait, ready, waiting for somebody to call you on the phone? Are you ready, waiting for somebody to confront you face to face and say, hey, will you come to Jesus? Or, or it might be, you're already a Christian and you're waiting for God's call. Saying, okay, maybe someday somebody will call me up. Maybe the preacher's going to call me and ask me to do this. And maybe I'll say yes, maybe I'll say no. Or maybe you're like Zacchaeus. Maybe you're bursting at the seams. Maybe you're ready to run with enthusiasm and grab hold of the opportunity. You're not going to let something like the fact that you're short and everybody else is tall get in the way. You have to do it. Next page, we, we see a little bit of the background the author provides. It says, our focal text begins with Jesus and the disciples entering the city of Jericho. Jericho, we may remember, was Joshua's first military conquest when the Israelites entered into the Promised Land. The city of antiquity became the proving ground of God's love for Israel. So it's an ancient city, uh, thousands of years old. Next paragraph, New Testament times, Jericho was a prosperous and flourishing trade center located about five miles west of Jerusalem. Jericho in the vicinity appear to have been territory where Jesus and the disciples frequently traveled. The road to Jericho was also a place where robbery and other violent acts were common, but Jesus never allowed them to deter him from his ministry. Yeah, Jericho, robbery, violent attacks, you know, that's the setting. 
for the story of the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan is a story Jesus tells, also in the Gospel of Luke, about a man who's traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. He's on that Jericho road. And he gets mugged, beaten, robbed, left for dead. So that's, that's that context there of Jericho. The author continues, still page 92. Likewise, the Christ within our hearts calls us to be courageous in meeting people's needs and sharing our faith. In other words, hey, yeah, Jericho Road's dangerous, Jesus. Shouldn't go that way. Just stay away. Just stay in Jerusalem. Jerusalem's pretty safe. Or, or better yet, stay up in Galilee. People in Galilee like you. They're not going to crucify you there. But no, Jesus takes the risk. Knows it's risky. He goes anyway because he knows people like Zacchaeus need him. What risks are we willing to take? What, what risks are you willing to take in going to people that might laugh in your face, people who might reject you? People might say, Jesus, I'm not religious. It goes on here, the author says, if the world is our parish, as John Wesley believed. And you see, John Wesley often got in trouble in his day for ministering outside of his parish. Because in the Church of England in that day, you are a pastor appointed to a particular parish. We'd say it appointed to a particular church. And your job is to minister in that church and its territory, but not go outside it. John the Wesley didn't have what we would call a regular appointment. He just went all over the place, all over England, up into Scotland, across into Ireland, to Wales, went all over. He said, I look on the whole world as my parish. No, it's most natural for us in our town to look at Fairfield, look at Freestone County as our parish, because that's where we live. That's where we operate. But we have influence beyond that. This video, this, this teaching that I'm doing right now, it, it's going to be on, on the internet. It's going to be on YouTube. It's going to be on Facebook. It's going to be out there. Anybody in the world can watch it. And my prayer is anybody who speaks English can get something out of it. But what about you? Does, does your reach only go as far as Fairfield? Only as far as Freestone County? I bet some of you are on social media. I bet some of you have a witness that goes even outside of Texas, even maybe outside of the U.S. Do you think the world is your parish? Do you think of being a witness for Jesus, extending his blessings beyond just where you are now? The author concludes that paragraph, still on page 92, with everyone needs to know who Jesus is, even Zacchaeus. Yeah, Zacchaeus needs to know who Jesus is. But, but I'd go even farther. I'd say, yes, people need to know who Jesus is. But they also need to know Jesus. There's lots of people out there. I know who they are. But I don't know them. This thing we call Christianity includes a relationship with Jesus where we know him and he knows us. We talk to him. We listen to him. But it's more than knowing about him. The author continues, Luke describes Zacchaeus as a ruler of tax collectors, a wealthy person. He says, this positioned him as someone prestigious and prominent in the community. He is somebody. But, the author says, many in the Jewish community would have seen him as an insult and an embarrassment to his Jewish heritage because he worked for the Roman government. He's associated with the wrong people. What about us? Do, do we ever get our affiliations, whether it's our political affiliations, our social affiliations, maybe the college team we cheer for, we still cheer for any teams, and pro teams, if we cheer for any pro teams, the city we live in, the county we live in, do we let our associations there shut us off from some people who might not have the same allegiance that we do? They don't have the same allegiance to the same team, the same political party, the same alumni network. Do we look at them as insults and embarrassments? He goes on here. Next paragraph, top of page 93, Zacchaeus was a traitor. He's seen as a traitor and a con man, all wrapped up in one. But as scripture shows, one touch from heaven can make the vilest clean. So here's Zacchaeus, 
rich guy, successful, but a social outcast, a reject, a traitor, an insult. What kind of people in our world, in our community, are the equivalent of Zacchaeus today? People that people like us don't approve of. People that people like us look down on. People that people like us might not want darkening the doors of our churches or showing up at our meetings. Who are those people? And has God broken our heart for them? Has God shaped us and worked in us in such a way that we can go to them like Jesus went to Zacchaeus? We continue. Luke 19, 3, we see Zacchaeus's intense curiosity playing out. Again, Zacchaeus had to see Jesus. He was not about to let his short stature or the large crowd rob him of his opportunity. The fact that he physically ran. Dignified men in that era don't run. Climb into a sycamore tree, you think dignified men do that? And waited until Jesus came by, shows the level of his determination. This would be his great moment. Zacchaeus would not miss it. How great and on fire would the church be today if people had that level of commitment to see and follow Jesus? Do you have that level of commitment, that level of desire, to see Jesus, to meet Jesus, to experience Jesus, to be claimed by him. What are you doing in your life? What, what evidence would we look at in your life to see your pursuit of Jesus, your investment of your time, your effort to know him, to become like him? Have, have you taken up the spiritual disciplines? Last week, I preached on disciplines of solitude, silence, and prayer. This coming week, I'll be preaching on disciplines of fasting and scripture. What, what disciplines are you engaging in that show your commitment, that show your willingness to be transformed in the image of Jesus, that, that you're submitting to, to be transformed into the kind of person God can use to reach this community for Jesus? And we have the next section, starting at the bottom of 93, Zacchaeus meets Jesus, and I'm going to pick it up at the top of page 94. Jesus sees Zacchaeus in the tree. The Lord then looked up and without hesitation or any prompting told Zacchaeus to come down at once. I must stay in your home today. So we start off with Zacchaeus who must see Jesus. He's absolutely committed to, I'm going to see Jesus no matter what. And yet here's Jesus also expressing a similar necessity. Zacchaeus, you have to come down. I have to be at your house today. So why did Jesus say that? Why did Jesus think he had to be at Zacchaeus' house? You know what the text says about that? Nothing, no explanation. But we see the results. We see that Zacchaeus, for some reason, climbs down the tree, runs home, and receives Jesus. The author puts it in that second full paragraph on 94. He says the results are clear, but the dynamics of what brought about the sudden change and this dishonest tax collector still leave me mystified. He continues, perhaps that is a message for us today. In an attempt to find meaning and purpose in our lives, we often find ourselves running toward things such as power, position, money, and other pursuits that only offer us temporary fixes at best. Jesus presents himself at whatever point we find ourselves in life with living water and bread that quench our deepest thirst of hunger. That living water, that bread, that's Jesus himself. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Jesus says, I am the door, I'm the gate. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Yet here's Zacchaeus, not sure what he's getting himself into. Not even sure if he understands himself, just I gotta see Jesus. Jesus called me. Hey, yeah, I'm going to go home and I'm going to receive him. Don't know what's going to happen. Don't know what the consequences are going to be, but I'm going to answer. Sometimes we just don't understand ourselves. We don't understand our motivations. We don't understand our motivations that might take us toward things that our culture calls good. Fame, alignment with the right political characters or the right famous people, uh, the collection of stuff, what, what our society says is fun. 
And, and yet we do it. Do we respond to Jesus like Zacchaeus though? Next paragraph. When Zacchaeus heard Jesus' call, he immediately responded. Jesus called. Zacchaeus answered. Is this not a message for us today? Furthermore, the text says that he came down happy to welcome Jesus. The idea of happiness suggests that there was no stress or tension in making this decision. Zacchaeus' prompt action. Did it promptly. Did it immediately. Hey, yeah, I'm, I'm with you, Jesus. I'm going. Let's do this. Can we do that? Can we get a prompt response? We see... The author continues there in the paragraph at the bottom of page 94. The blessing that would come from this encounter demanded immediate action. Two phrases in our key verse are at once and today. Christ bids all, includes us, Christ bids all to seize the now of this moment, discovering the wonders of God's love. I'd go farther, discover the wonders of God's love, yeah, but, but also the wonders of God's calling. It's not just preachers that God's call. God calls. It's not just Sunday school teachers that God calls. It's not just missionaries, professional Christians that God calls. God calls people like Zacchaeus. God calls ordinary people, people like you, to respond to him, to say yes to him, to take his message. Our author continues on top of page 95. One of the great appeals and appreciation for me about the United Methodist Church is its open invitation and display of opportunities whereby God calls us into ministry. Everyone, lay and clergy, has a place of worth and is welcome to the table. Yeah, everybody. God, part of what God's doing in seeking to make us holy, to remake us in the image of Jesus, is to prepare us to be fruitful in his kingdom work. Be fruitful in bringing other people to faith and to bringing people to life from death to bringing justice where there's injustice, to bringing peace where there's conflict. God calls us to do that. He equips us to do that. Author continues, verse 7 is an unfortunate reality of life. Everyone does not always share our joy and happiness in finding meaning in life. Sometimes people grumble. People ever grumble when you're around? Oh, no, look at that. Richard's here. Yeah, I got to go somewhere else. He's a killjoy. Do we ever do that at church? Do we ever just politely ignore people that if they're the wrong kind of person or somebody we don't really like or, or what? Do we grumble that Jesus might show love to sinners, to broken people? Author uh, continues in the next section, Zacchaeus' salvation. Christ makes a difference in our lives. This truth is attested to all who sincerely trust and obey God. It is a historical proclamation in the lives of the saints of God. When Zacchaeus met Jesus, something miraculous and life-changing happened in his life that others would see. Jesus did not call him to change. Well, at least in the story that Luke tells us, we see no words of Jesus other than, Hey, Zacchaeus, come down. Got to go to your house today. Next thing we see is Zacchaeus talking. Zacchaeus announces his intention to change. Look, Lord, I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anyone, I repay them four times as much. These Zacchaeus, this Jew that's working for the Romans, working for the bad guys, he knows what the law says. He knows what the Old Testament teaches about restitution when you've robbed people. And that's what he's doing here when he's returning to the poor, when he's restoring fourfold. Salvation comes to Zacchaeus' house. Now, what do we mean by salvation here? Salvation is a pretty broad term. Sometimes we reduce it to going to heaven when you die. Yeah, salvation includes the afterlife, includes our eternity, but it's more than this. In the middle of page 96, uh, the author says the word salvation generally refers to God's deliverance from the power of sin in our lives. Power of sin, power of death, power of hell, the lostness and brokenness that we, that we live in. A review of the Hebrew and Greek origins also reveals that words such as safety, welfare, peace, wholeness, prosperity, and cure from disease or healing, all those come under the umbrella of salvation. So the salvation Zacchaeus is experiencing here is not just get out of hell free card, but it's a transformation of his life that brings him into true life, true life in Christ. 
Next paragraph. Finally, Jesus used his visit to Zacchaeus' house as a teaching moment on his purpose for coming into the world. He came to seek and save the lost. Can we think that way? Can, can we think that as we respond to Jesus, that he sends us to seek and save the lost? Are, are we willing to think of other people as lost, as, as maybe wandering around aimlessly, maybe about to fall off a cliff, metaphorically maybe? Maybe they don't even know they're lost. Maybe they're going gung-ho into what the world values. And yet Jesus sees them as lost. So Jesus calls us to seek and save the lost, to take up the same mission he has. Top of page 97, Zacchaeus was on Jesus' list as a son of Abraham. Some, somebody of value. He's not living that way. He's lost. Yeah. But God wants him. In the last full paragraph, the powerful message of Zacchaeus' story is that we are, are a part of the cast in the story. God still speaks today. I've said many times that one of the ways that we can talk about becoming a Christian is that when we put our faith in Christ, we give him our allegiance. We are becoming willing participants in his story, willing participants in the same story we read in the Bible, the same story that Zacchaeus was an actor in. The same story that continues even today. What, what excites you about being a part of Jesus' story? What excites you about God calling you to himself, offering you life, offering you a life that matters, and offering his life to others? God wants to spend eternity with you. But that's not all. God wants to spend eternity with other people who are running away from him. If God wants to do a work in your life, like he did in the life of Zacchaeus, that transforms you and that equips you to be a part of his mission to seek and save the lost, to redirect them toward life, life in Christ. Are you willing to try that? Are you willing to say yes to Jesus? Willing to take up the disciplines that might make it happen? Well, let's pray. Father, I thank you again for the story of Zacchaeus. Help us, like Zacchaeus, to willingly enter into your story, become willing participants who listen to you, who obey you, respond to you in faith and trust so that you might accomplish your purposes through us and around us in our community, wherever we go. We ask you boldly in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us today. Look forward to seeing you in worship. Bye.